I should tell you, this is a post-election survey, something we have in the U.S. but have not had uh, here in Britain, uh, where we do not just the exit poll, which is mostly just to say getting the vote right and the number of seats right, um, but a survey that's, in this case, 25 minutes long, conducted right after the election on the uh, Saturday and Sunday, when people have very fresh, before they're impacted by uh, future events, why they did what they did, how they understood their vote, how they, what they want to have going forward. Um, we believe by preserving that, you get, uh, you know, you can be, a lot will happen in the interim, but uh, there was meaning in this election, and that, and that meaning ought to be translated to the political class and to the pro process. And so this was the opportunity, delighted to do it with Matthew, to talk through, you know, the, the, the findings of the uh, survey. Uh, it's an election that, was clearly a change election, in some ways like the U.S. election, a change um, election. It had a strong p a political reform, you know, content to it. It was a bit about the economy and getting the economy and, and you know, deficit right. But it was not about ideas, not about ideology, not about uh, big vision. And it's part of the frustration that voters had with this uh, election was it didn't, they didn't think they were voting the future of the country um, because they weren't given that kind of option. And when we, when, we, when you'll see, when we look here at why you voted for the conservatives, and it's very important, <clears throat> we gave them you know, a whole range of options that went to leadership qualities to, you know, to change. But everything that's linked to a overall conservative worldview, pro-family, low tax, big society, small government, all those things just at the bottom, that they are not, you know, they are not part of what it is that brought people to vote. And it, was, and, as, and it turns out it, the conservatives were purposeful about not creating that kind of election. Well, that has consequences, uh, as you'll see in, our, in, our, in other questions we looked at. Um, this is an electorate that is center-left, progressive, I'm not sure what language we're using, but uh, um, center-left progressive um, uh, in its vote, the, small, the, the majority that voted you know, for Lib Dems and Labor as well as some of the other smaller parties. Um, but it's actually more progressive in its views um, than that vote uh, as measured, uh, measured here. This, they put in a government that they are you know, looking for a bigger governmental role, less market role, not a time to cut taxes, worry more that they will go too far cutting deficits than uh, that they will um, not do enough. And so that they, the election, elections matter, what battles get drawn, what issues are fought about, and the choices they made, uh, by, certainly by the conservatives. Lib Dems had their election, for sure. It was about political reform, and that's one of the reasons people change in political reform, the reasons people voted for them, and people have moved on political reform, you'll see you know, in this survey. There's now a very strong two-thirds uh, in favor of uh, uh, electoral reform. Uh, we also looked at campaign finance reform. My guess is any, in this context, any reform we would have put out before them, they would have said yes to, um, that this is, the election is, you know, has, you know, has, you know, has shaped that. Labor did not, uh, labor, this was a, uh, you know, labor did not, uh, it, it, got, it got by on the smallest tactical kind of arguments about, uh, about the economy, not cutting, wasn't a big vision statement, it was cut, don't cut now, cut later. It's a, but it was not, had no larger context to it. Labor held on to its vote simply on preserving, doing the best of protecting public services, uh, maybe on getting the economy right, but none of its vision, uh, none of the larger visionary aspects. It was a, in, uh, this was a, um, I think, a desperately bad election for labor. Um, it was not a good election. For, by the way, it's not a good election for the Tories. Um, the You'll see in this, this is, this is not a modernizing party. There's no, at least there's no evidence in this data that they performed like other, other modernizing parties, either as Labor did here or as at various times modernizing uh, Democratic parties center, or center-left parties in Europe. Um, they did not win young voters. They did not win above, below age 55. Um, they didn't win the, the suburbs. They, not, none of the things you would, uh, or Greater London, none of the things you would expect to happen in a party that is showing the, um, the way toward being a modernizing uh, uh, party. So it was not, it was not, they did not succeed either in shaping the ideological space or give, g making gains that gave it the ability to emerge as a modernizing party out of this. The voters were, were ready to take, you know, to choose another option. It was a disaster election for labor uh, in outcome and in, in, in the, the scale of the defeat. 
um, but it's uh, but it's uh, it's also disastrous in terms of where they where they lost support. Um, they uh, in fact lost support at the uh, at the upper end to Lib Dems. They lost working class voters uh, dr uh, quite dramatically to to the conservatives. Uh, with Lib Dems losing support. While the Lib Dems did, overall vote didn't change very much, it changed its distribution. They did better you know, upscale and, and worse downscale, so they changed their distribution of where their vote came from, which has consequences. It meant that co the conservatives couldn't get the full advantage of the changes they were making by being nice about issues like immigration in Europe. They couldn't get the advantage of those uh, changes and probably didn't maximize what they could have done amongst working class voters, but the uh, but the labor law had lost very badly and it's been now through two elections in a row. I would argue three elections in a row. We'll we'll talk about this. Now, let's not forget that 2001 had a dramatic drop in turnout as uh, working class voters pulled out of the electorate. 2005 was the Iraq election in which the surge of voters in more diverse uh, constituencies and uh, and more better educated went to the Lib Dems, and then we had this election with Gordon Brown um, and the economic crisis and expenses, which drove voters further you know away. For all that, Labor could have won this election, um, well, and we'll t uh, and we'll uh, we'll talk about that. Let me just show you some data, so I'm not just not making this up. Um, that there's uh, and then we uh, this there's a there's a full deck that will be um, on the RSA uh, site. I just put up a few of the. Um, of these, so I could get through this very, you know, very quickly. The vote you know, the vote without the nor without uh, uh, Northern uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, it was quite striking how late people were and uh, and where they went in this uh, election. We've not quite seen anything. We tracked this question. We've not asked it in Britain, uh, but you're more likely to get, you know, five percent on the last, you know, on the day of the election, not fifteen percent. So you're dealing with the last couple of days. You're getting you know, 29% um, in, in the last couple of days saying they made up their mind. Uh, and, by the way, and if you looked at how they voted in this, it, it, it reflects, I mean, what happened here is that this election got locked in with the half the, uh, the electorate that looks very much like the election came out. And so it was very hard for the Lib Dems, for others to make, you know, to make headway. They made, Lib Dems made dramatic gains after the, you know, first debate. Labor pulled back uh, and made some gains after the last, um, you know, debate. But at the end, it locked back in, uh, you know, with with conservatives uh, sealing in their plurality. When you ask again the reasons why you voted, and uh, the, the 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 nature of this exercise is that we give people the ability to answer three time responses um, on eleven, I think eleven responses, but three responses uh, that that are choosing. Some of these are thematic, some of these are issues, some of these are personalities, um, but it, al it allows the respondent um, to mix up the things that they're, what's, and what's important about this, obviously time for a change is the dominant, as well as the economy and debt, you know, together, being anti-Brown as a vote, um, and then to some extent Cameron's qualities. The reason I say it's a non-ideological election is if you look at, you know, small government, uh, pro-family, taxes, all those are at the bottom. And so you've got to think of people having three options, you know, to pick one of these conservative philosophic positions and only 10% are choosing, you know, small government, big society. Uh, it's just not what's driving um, the, uh, the, you know, the conservative vote. Uh, when you look at labor's vote, it's protecting the 58%, the you know, choose protecting NHS uh, and schools. Um, the economic argument they're making as well as the ongoing belief that the conservatives represent the food privileged few, anti, you know, Cameron, and then a straight labor vote, a little bit of Brown's qualities. Okay, but then we get down to other kind of more issue content and it drops off the uh, chart. Lib Dem overwhelmingly driven by time for a change and electoral reform. Um, and anti-Cameron, anti-Brown, um, as so anti-politics, anti-ground, you know, driving it. And then their idea of a, a fairer Britain, and they are introducing, they're the only one who've introduced that, their, their, their theme that's got into the rationale, you know, for voting. And people came out of this, you know, with a, you know, large majorities uh, in favor of the reforms that we were, we, t uh, we tested the, the, uh, the three options. Um, with the um, transferable vote and P, uh, in uh, PR, as well as campaign finance reform, it's interesting that labor voters uh, come out stronger for PR as their high as their highest uh, as their highest uh, charge. Uh, the um, 
the, the main economic argument, by the way, the, the fact that we're asking this question, and I, I, I watched it during the, uh, during the debates, and the prime minister started on this issue. That was his entry into the, into the election, was this debate over you know, they're gonna, uh, the cuts they're going to make, and the, that was what the first was, debate was about. The prime minister came back to it. Okay. First of all, it's a gigantically small issue. <laughs> As in terms of, and, and when we, in fo we did hold focus groups during the course of the election, people just did not care about the six billion pounds and, and, uh, and when it would be cut or when. It just was, it was the measure of how small and tactical labor had become that it, uh, and, and to some extent the, the conservatives as well, uh, that that became central. It was a divided, um, you know, issue, you know, and labor voters, you know, more for it. But interesting, Lib I, I highlighted only because Lib Dems, Looked more like labor uh, in response, you know, in the days after the election, in uh, response to that, you know, to that um, question. Uh, there's no doubt that immigration and Europe are playing themselves out in this election. It doesn't come out as a choice on the voting in part because the candidates conspired not to make it um, uh, an issue, and that will be debated. But we we have a thermometer scale that goes zero to 100. Um, 50 is kind of a mean score. Uh, and below t 25 or below is a very cool negative response. Okay, so this is the percentage who give overall a cool negative response to the word immigration. Uh, and if you look at labor voters, these are people who did not vote labor but considered about 10% who considered voting, you know, labor. It turns out that they are less anti-immigrant uh, because they are more in the Lib Dem camp. Uh, we look at labor voters from 2005. Um, to see what you know they're like, they are less anti-immigrant, uh, 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 and then Lib Dem voters are obviously very low. But then Tory voters, though half of them, uh, were you know were intensely anti-immigration. Uh, uh, you get a similar pattern on Europe, um, and I have no doubt that this uh, figured uh, into this. One of the things we discussed was our, their strategy. On that same thermometer scale, we looked at the parties and we looked at the different leaders. You know, the, uh, you know, labor will have to look at the Gordon Brown numbers and the Tony Blair numbers, which uh, hang over this election. Um, and it's part of what people were, in closing this chapter, um, people were doing um, the, uh, with the strong negative backdrop. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at this by class, this is, a, this is, it is more fascinating than any other aspect is to look at it uh, uh, by class and and looking at labor, uh, looking at, I'm sorry, looking at the conservatives vote and rem how remarkably flat it was. Uh, when I would work for Tony Blair uh, um, and in the early uh, early on in this process, and I would present and this is in the first in the first election, first general election, and I presented the results and I showed a flattening of the results that was going across class. He viewed that as a victory. He was actually more interested in that result, having a flat result, than he was in having a high vote number. I'm sure, I'm sure he wanted to win, and he wanted to win with a large majority, but he, was, he viewed that as a sign of his, the success of his politics if he could cut across class. Now, the difference was that he was operating, you know, about 10 points higher uh, on the scale at f and flat. Uh, you know, this is interesting, because it's, but it is very, but it is, it is, it is, it is flat, and when we talk about it, it may well be the Tories get squeezed by the politics that takes place um, with Lib Dems and Labor, depending on what happens going forward. My experience with working in Europe, and I worked in Germany and, and, uh, and Austria and other places where the, where the Greens, once the Greens emerge on the scene and begin winning young voters and, and dominating some of the reform issues beyond the in, uh, environment, I don't have an evidence of them going away. <laughs> that then when they become the party that is the you know that that young people and that generation are intrigued with as where the future lies and uh, they that that stays and it impacts their class over over time and the fact of the matter is you'll see this conservatives didn't take very much gains there's another pattern on the um, what's happening on the seat working class voters and the poorer voters and, and pensioners um, where you have almost labor and conservatives running very close to uh, each other. And if you, this is co looking at ICM comparison um, to the, you know, last election. You can see, you know, um, how dramatic the drop is um, in these, you know, C2 and DE. 
uh, where clearly that there's a fundamental fundamental questions to be, you know, addressed. The fact is the conservatives didn't do that well in C1 in terms of picking up. I'm sorry. A B is uh, we're dealing with uh, executive business professional, um, you know, uh, um, graduates. You know, C1 we're uh, C1 we're de uh, dealing, um, you know, with uh, skilled workers and. Uh, 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 people with some uh, some education and training see too much more industrial working class DE as a combination of poor, low income, and pensioners. It's, it's basically it's upper middle class, middle middle class, lower middle class, and working class. Okay, I'll accept. Matthews. We all know what those, we're British. We all know what those terms mm -hmm. mean. <laughs> <laughs> I will take. We'll take them. <laughs> but what's interesting? I mean, Lib Dem made their gains here, even though their overall number didn't change. You know, in terms of up a, you know, you know, a point. Uh, what you really saw was the, uh, you know, AB numbers are fairly comparable. The C1 is a big, you know, is a, uh, and with the conservatives not, you know, not making gains. Uh, we asked again. This was right. We asked right on that weekend, right after the election, on whether you want a, um, uh, what kind of government to, to be uh, formed. Labor voters are very clear. It was also clear that Lib Dem voters preferred uh, a coalition with Labor. Uh, to a coalition uh, with the Tories. In the larger survey, I also ask, this says with a new leader, labor leader. I also ask in the other half sample with, without that, without that line um, there, and then there is not a, there's not a difference. That is, that is the, you have uh, the Lib Dems going into the unity, one which grows to 30 uh, percent, and there's an even split. It required a new leader for the Lib Dem voters to be open to this uh, you know, co uh, coalition. When you look at the parties, uh, we ask which parties better on a whole you know, range of, uh, of issues. The things that are marked in red are things in our uh, modeling programs have the best, the biggest impact on the vote in predicting the vote. Um, so winning that issue is, you know, very important. 40% is above their vote, having a vision to, for Britons to be successful. They came the closest to that, which was important, and trust to manage the economy, though. For these two parties to be close to parity on the economy, now that makes up for a big deficit. But this was after an enormous financial crisis, um, and everywhere else I've worked, people in power during these crises don't, you know, don't have parity on who you trust to handle the, you know, economy. So, um, the um, and improving living standards, you know, very important to the piece. What's interesting is right approach to immigration. Now it is true that. Conservatives are high on that. It's right at their vote, but it's not strong in the in the regression model, and that's because they didn't. The leader, the parties, made a decision not to make immigration uh, an issue. Therefore, it didn't drive the vote. They succeeded. Immigration was it was it was almost incidental, and the question will be if conservatives run a different kind of campaign, could they have raised their vote? I suspect that they uh, could. This is the attributes for, that Labor is dominant on. Um, average person is not surprising, but what's most interesting is how low their highest attributes just are in the mid low 30s, you know, below the vote that they had in the last election. There just was no attribute of the party which was any longer driving their, you know, their strength, uh, and they're weak on a whole series of things that matter: trust, 23 percent, immigration, right kind of change, 25 percent. This was a change election, and they just weren't part of it. Mm -hmm. Now, we tried to look at different ways of looking at what would be the audience, if you were thinking beyond this election, say, we don't want to just look at labor voters. We can't, this can't be where labor says, all right, let's make our future here. Uh, the people identify with labor down to 31%. It used to be 40%. It was 40% going into the 2005 election. Um, so there's been this major drop in identifiers, uh, which, by the way, have not gone to the conservatives. It has, uh, the, it's gone to non-party and small parties, and a little bit to uh, Lib Dem. Um, this is, uh, is self-reported labor vote. should be 36, but this is self-reported people that they uh, uh, voted for labor in 2005, so somewhat larger. This is the uh, block that said they considered labor in this election, okay, very seriously considered voting for labor in this election. That third, now, that gets us to a bigger space, uh, but, it's not, but it's also not good enough because it turns out Conservatives were not going back and forth between voting with labor. This is almost totally out of Lib Dem block. This is almost totally Lib Dem, potential Lib Dem voters that are um, here. It does not get you those disaffected. The voters that pulled away across 
most of the working class part of the electorate isn't here. Um, in fact, labor has to step back seriously. I said, take back, has to step back and look at what happened in this election, has to look what happened in 2005, has to look what happened in 2001, because it's lost big blocks of voters in each one, each of those elections. And when it thinks about going forward, it's got to think about a bigger, uh, bigger model. Uh, the labor itself is divided on some of the big questions on what you know role it should have now, assuming that electoral reform is going to pass. And we're going to have a diff, you know different pattern of you know of voting. We've asked whether labor should work to be you know the leading hegemonic uh, party uh, again, as it was, or whether it should be uh, work to lead in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. Now it's not a surprise that Lib Dem voters, you know, think it should be in you know coalition, but the labor voters in this election were split. They're evenly split on whether labor should be an hegemonic party or a leader of a coalition. Labor is undecided, it hasn't figured out whether it's part of a larger progressive you know, alignment that's to be settled. Equally, they, uh, um, uh, well, they, all, they don't think they should go back to being uh, old, um, um, uh, new, uh, old labor. So new labor, they want to be new. Uh, but on the other hand, when we ask about whether you want labor to be closer to the unions uh, or not, um, they, labor itself, you know, is divided. Labor voters, this is important, labor voters in this election, 54 say yes, closer to the union, 45. But if you take the 2005 voters, it, it leans um, to being not closer to the unions. That is, the voters that pulled away from us um, are much more cautious about the role of unions, and that's obviously going to be an important part of the debate going future. I'll just highlight a few th things that tell us that this was not an ideal election. That is, you couldn't have the result we did um, um, in most places with this set of views coming out of the election. To reduce debt, we will need to make major cuts in spending and public services, or to reduce debt, we must raise taxes broadly and do less cutting of, uh, of spending. Well, it's split overall. Overwhelmingly labor voters, overwhelmingly Lib, you know, Lib Dem voters, or a, plural, a good plurality of li uh, Lib Dem voters say raise taxes and cut less. Um, the um, the, cho the option of the dominant coalition was not, you know, not clearly dominant. Um, we asked whether this is the right time to cut taxes. I didn't display it. On, and overwhelmingly, people say this is not the right time to cut taxes, including mo uh, more uh, majority of conservatives say it's not time to cut taxes. You know, I'm more worried that they'll go too far in cutting so uh, social spending, public, or I'm more worried it won't go far enough um, and do enough to reduce the debt. You know. It's not close. I mean, the country is worried that they're going to go too far. That's dominant with labor and uh, uh, it's interesting that, you know, that the and Lib, and Lib Dem voters who are in a very similar place. This is obviously the big priorities choice to be made right now by this government. Lib Dem voters are with labor on this question, you know, not with the, you know, conservatives. Whether this is a time, this is a time for government to get more involved or a time to be more on markets. I promise you if I ask this question in America, I'd uh, get the opposite result. Mm -hmm. Okay, this cannot be an election that just uh, gave the conservatives the, la uh, the the largest vote. I have a similar result in asking about you know whether it's time for society versus the state. Um, so, just for speed, uh, on the EU, you've got a strong majority wanting less uh, involved, uh, including. Um, 77% of the conservatives, Lib Dems, you have 49% more involved. But I asked it in a harder way, whether you should be in Europe or out of Europe. Um, there, you see, again, you see that Lib Dems are the strongest pro-Europe group and yet find themselves with a, tor a majority of voters for the Tories um, set out of Europe. Just the last two things, two, last two exercises I did here was to try to test some big, bold, proposals, um, and I had to kind of make this up on election night as I was watching the results come to see what would potentially fit um, the, this uh, election. One is a bold idea on addressing the deficit with increased taxes um, and 10% cuts across uh, VAT, 10% uh, cuts, tolls, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it actually does get majority support. I'm embarrassed by the last question which I posed on inequality and fairness because of the level of support. I told my office when I got this result, you get fired for writing a question that produces 80% um, because it can't be a, there is no, there is no subject which 80% are genuinely um, supportive. This is too costless. It is the case because it does talk about 
make permanent the 50p rate, 50% tax on CO bonuses. Um, it used to be that that was seen to be a third rail. That is, if you, you get electrocuted, if you took up this issue, you couldn't, you know, labor could not do that. That the, this is in labor's name or a, uh, a center-left center coalition. But there's very strong support for the idea of addressing inequality and fairness as a bigger future project. But that's a bigger future question. Great. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Stan, thank you. I know from uh, scanning the audience that you're going to get some uh, mm. tough questions uh, when <laughs> I hand it over to, to them. But let me just <coughs> start off with a couple. Um, I, I just have to ask this question, and I don't. Uh, people may think I have a personal agenda, but I still have to ask it. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, would Labour have won with a different leader? I think they would have formed the government with a different leader. Hmm. Uh, the, I'm struck by how immediate the response was uh, in our question here when labor without changing, removing Gordon Brown from this made it possible for labor to be part of the future. It was very hard for, man for many of these voters with Gordon Brown there. Uh, I'm also struck by the polls that we've seen after the election, which has seen no surge. I'm not used to seeing this. Usually this is some honeymoon. Um, in terms of how you would vote now, there was no surge uh, for the for the conservatives. They're getting basically what they got at the time of the election, somewhat down and a shift to, to labor, with the and and also as you've seen membership growth for labor. And so there clearly was a couple points at least um, in a change in le uh, leadership. I mean, you know, people noted that beforehand. A couple well, it turns out in this world, a couple points <laughs> between friends matters a lot in terms of you know, who forms the government. And yes, I think a, um, a change in leadership would have produced a different result. And in relation to David Cameron's... Uh, the advantage of my doing this, coming from outside, is that I can, I, don't, I can just say these things and not worry about getting in trouble and not worried yeah. about whose toes I step on. Um, <laughs> the, the, the David Cameron's performance, given the results, was mm. his strategy of, broadly speaking, appealing to the center ground, being reasonably vague about policy uh, and emphasizing change, as distinct from a arguing for righteous mm -hmm. center values, making it about ideas. Was that the right strategy, even though the result was not that impressive? Yeah. Had, the, had Clegg not had his debate and had the Lib Dems not surged in, this, in, the, in the election and not made genuine gains in a significant part of the electorate, the strategy probably would have worked. He would have, he would have um, had, an, uh, I think, an absolute majority. He would have had enough seats to form a government, um, but for Lib Dem. So, can we fault him for having a strategy that's so close to the, you know to the edge <laughs> of success? Because something important got in the way of it, um, and I think got in way an enduring way. I mean, the big. I mean, there's two. There's two big problems. Other problems. One is that he decided, he made a decision not to do immigration, not to do Europe, and to, uh, to at a time when, as you see, it's a big issue. There are voters moving on it. There were more votes for him to be gained, I believe, you know, on the issue. Uh, given the Lib Dem presence, he probably could have done that without, you know, suffering at the, the places where he was trying to look softer. His bigger problem was he didn't change his own party. You know, majority here don't, don't think he changed his own party. We asked that in a, that question here. They, you know, the, for... Tony Blair changing his own party was the measure of whether he was real. You know, I thought he was charismatic and you know interesting and new. You know, but people always asked, you know, is he smarmy? Is he real? You know, and but the evidence of it was referendum on clause four, clause four that he took on the unions, that he changed block voting, that he made commitments on tax that were you know that were for labor, um, you, know, you know, bold. There was no evidence that they had that Cameron was changing his own party. There was no evidence that he was real. Um, and I, I actually think that's the bigger problem. If you're going to be a modernizing leader, then you've got to do real things that people can see a changed party. I think the bigger problem is it looked like spin at the end, which left him vulnerable to these other, you know, other forces. Two, two final questions to me before I open up. The first is, what's the... Um, so clearly the Conservatives do not have a very powerful mandate. This coalition does not have a very powerful mandate for what it's doing, to, to, mm. to, 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 to say the very least. Right. Mm. 
What's your experience around the world of the capacity of parties to, to create a post hoc mandate, as it were, to use mm -hmm. the early period in office? I mean, people often say about Margaret Thatcher mm -hmm. that the 1979 Conservative Manifesto was quite moderate, mm -hmm. that there wasn't like, a huge sea change. People were pretty upset about Labour and the trade unions, but there wasn't a great sea change. But it was mm -hmm. what she did in the subsequent years which helped to cement this kind of Thatcherite bloc, which was then exploited mm -hmm. for the, the subsequent decade. So what's your kind of view of the opportunity the Conservatives and Liberals, the coalition now has to kind of create that mandate which wasn't mm -hmm. there for them on election day? Yeah. I mean, I have plenty. In fact, it's probably more normal that you face circumstances that, you know, usually economic, if there's the meeting the day after the bankers come in and tell you you can't do any of those things that you promised to do in the election, you have to have a... Um, and so you've got to, you know, revisit your mandate, try to bring your voters with you. And so um, and events happen after but when Bush was elected, on 11 events happened that changed. He didn't believe in nation building um, and getting involved in the world, and that all changed, you know, with events. So it's you know it's very it's it's more normal than not. Though I'm not I'm not sure here how they, given the polit given the profile of the voters that you saw here of the Lib Dem voters and conservative voters, they are in very different places. It's not it's not clear how you would take that government in a decisive new direction. I. To me, that the most of the political reforms are likely to accrue to the advantage of the Lib Dems, whereas the conservatives own most of the cuts in, in spending and deficit reduction. So I'm not. So I'm the to me, I think it's very constrained. I mean, I think they are governing narrowly, you know, within the election mandate that they were given, which is re address the economy, reduce the deficit, get that under control, make political reforms. Um, I think they are, they are actually, I think, likely, and I think about given the agreement, almost have to, you know, proceed, you know, with that mandate. I, I don't see how the conservatives end up helped, how they come out of that. I can see how Cameron could come out of it personally stronger. I'm not sure how the conservatives go to an electorate stronger, unless they genuinely, they become, unless they are transformed by it, unless they become a, refor a reforming party. But I can't see how this party, you know, the, you know that has those views, you know that probably has you know the, you know that par that parliamentary conservative party how they would be that surprising reforming party. Finally, um, in relation to um, the fracturing of Labour support in the working class, mm -hmm. I mean that seems to be a characteristic of support for the main centre left party in many other countries across Europe mm -hmm. and other places. The one exception being America, where the Democrats mm -hmm. uh, um, ha have maintained a very solid level of support mm -hmm. in their kind of core voter categories, whether that, that's mm -hmm. class-based or, or race-based. Mm -hmm. So is there, <coughs> if we move to electoral reform and there are other alter there are alternatives for the work mm -hmm. working class voters to vote for, alternative ways of expressing mm -hmm. kind of frustration, resentment against mm -hmm. the system, isn't the prognosis for Labour bad, kind of whatever happens? Or do you think Labour could actually get back to, once again, scoring in a 50% plus amongst working class voters? I don't know. Because I don't have, the, I mean, but it is, it is the central question. I mean, and I did get into all this, you know, through in America working what was called Macomb County and the Reagan Democrats. It was trying to figure out how the Democratic Party could reclaim the, work, you know, the white working class, the ethnic white working class to the, and so most of my life has been devoted to that task. Um, I've did now worked for it. I, <laughs> uh, we've succeeded and I, you know, but it, which, but it, ha it says a lot about America. I, you know, Macomb County, um, you know, Barack Obama was so racist, you know, in those terms, in historic terms. School, school busing issues, the, you know, the reaction to the Detroit riots, very, you know, uh, uh, voted for George Wallace, okay. You know, Barack Obama carried Macomb County by you know, like 66,000 votes. Okay, well, let's rest. We're, um, we can retire, if, you know, if you you know do that. But what was what was interesting was that Oakland County, which is right next door, which is the most affluent county um, in Michigan, uh, Obama won by a hundred thousand. Uh, and so that there's like all these other dynamics going on that are creating the modern Democratic Party and the center left, you know, in America, which has to do with ethnic diversity. Um, the age uh, we have a we have a young population um, driven and uh, uh, driven by you know the uh, immigration, which is um, we have you know, under thirty voters or you know forty percent are you know are non-white. You know um, new voters coming in eighteen are majority non-white, but are, but the whites are also more tolerant who are growing up in that generation. That is so that there's a 
I mean, part of what's going on here is very, very exceptional, I think, to America, which has to do with its diversity, uh, which is changing attitudes. And Obama makes it possible, if he's successful. If he's not successful, it, it hasn't. But I think he will be successful. Uh, as a successful president with that kind of coalition, makes it possible to have a broad bottom-up coalition, including the working class. Okay, I don't think that model, I w you know, you know, passing health insurance is not going to work here. Uh, I think the model's different, and every place else I work in Europe, I work for the Social Democrats in the Czech Republic now, elections at the end of, you know, end of May. I worked for the center right in Romania for President Pesescu. Uh, but I've, you know, the left has lost everywhere except Portugal and, you know, and Greece. Um, Portugal and uh, Greece. <laughs> what do those two <laughs> countries have in common? <laughs> um, and I think, when, I mean, and, and if we step back from this, it's a long, it's a, you know, it's obviously true during the whole period of new labor governance has been losing these voters and has not figured out how to re renew its project in a way that spoke to them. There's a specific problem this election, which is shared with the rest of Europe, as we saw in the European elections and also the elections in different countries, that the, you know, the uh, working class voters do not find anything particularly appealing about the mainstream left parties. Um, and that's the challenge.